I'm very glad that Dimi invited me to speak about policy in the community where many other people could do that. And I have this idea that maybe it's more interesting to talk with you why policy is important instead of some specificities of European policy that I'm working on. And the question came to my mind when I um, uh, watched the video from yesterday's opening and read the, uh, heard the sentence that a lot of the discussion is about the capacity and possibility to use the edit button. So I have this question for you and for myself, what can policy do to make people press edit on Wikipedia? By raising this question, I won't say policy is not just about policy or not about law. Uh, it's about important things. So I do policy work with three affiliations. Uh, globally, it's with Creative Commons. In Europe, it's with Comunia, the European Association on the Digital Public Domain. And in Poland, I run a digital think tank called Centrum Cyfrowe. And recently, when someone asked me, what's your background, who are you? I said, oh, I was trained as a sociologist, but I'm a policy guy. And I actually thought it's quite interesting that I define myself in this way. I got involved in policy a bit by accident. Eight years ago, I was doing some academic work and Creative Commons activism, and I was asked to join a strategic unit in the Polish government. And this gave me a taste of doing policy work, which I continue to do. So I believe actually policy is quite interesting. How many of you think the same? Mmm, you're just being nice, I think. <laughs> or this is a very self-selected crowd. Um, but policy actually, it's, as I said, it's not just about law, it's about, very broadly speaking, culture. So it's about sort of defining where we want to be as a society. Truthfully, it's not the only tool you can use for that. Um, but um, I will tell you why I think we cannot lag behind with policy. There's an interesting quote by Buckminster Fuller, a brilliant designer who said, you never change things by fighting existing reality. You need to design something new. And, and that's probably a quote that might speak well to you because Wikipedia was this something new that didn't really fight with the past but just offered a, a completely new solution. But the trick is I don't think we can leave the past behind. You know, the dinosaurs don't die out on their own. They turn to live pretty long and we have to function in the same society with them. And I think policy is the tool that can build these connections between those that are very modern and in advance and, and, and institutions and governments that are not yet there. Policy is the bridge, it's also the method they understand, even if it's kind of challenging and sometimes even boring. So for example, uh, you Wikipedians came up with a pretty fascinating model, uh, often called the pure production model, for sharing and producing content. But this model, it's not a bubble, it's huge, but it still doesn't cover all of our reality. And the question is, can this model scale even further? If the answer is yes, I'd like that to happen, my belief is you have to use policy work um, to do that. Um, so this slide is in the wrong, I'll come back to it, it's in the wrong place. Secondly, policy is design. If all goes well, policy is about designing new rules, new institutions. Very often it doesn't happen that way. If you read literature on policy design, you find out there's also such a thing as policy non-design. And that's what, how scientists basically describe that things happen because they're lobbied, because uh, the policy process is broken, because someone wants that to happen, or there are strong social emotions in play that offer no possibility to have a rational discussion. But if all goes well, policy gives you an opportunity to have a reality that's designed in a good way. Uh, I think there's an interesting relationship between policy and innovation, in particular social innovation. Wikipedia could be called that. Social innovation is very exciting, but often it happens at a small scale. And actually, if you look at a lot of open projects, Wikipedia is the outstanding one in terms of size. Many other ones are not as big and successful. They're very innovative, but they're small. On the other hand, policy applies to really broad parts of our society, but it's often very hard to call it innovative. So the question is, how, how can we make this, this magic in the middle happen, how there's love between policy and innovation? And I think Creative Commons, a project I'm involved in for now over a decade, is such an example. Um, it, it, it's a project that started as not a policy innovation. And, and this is the quote that... Uh, I, I had too early. Uh, this is a quote from Larry Lessig that you can only find if you understand Polish because it's in the introduction to the Polish edition of his book Free Culture, which we translated. 
10 years ago. And, and he writes there about how um, Creative Commons might have a victory in the future the way Solidarity had victory in Poland, but he says no victory is certain and you need 100,000 small victories. In my opinion, these 100,000 small victories are the 100,000 licensing uses that individuals make and that make the commons grow. So he's basically saying you need to go step by step. And, and as we all know, sort of Creative Commons was created in opposition, in a way, to policies uh, in a situation where law couldn't be fixed. So there was an idea to start, sort of start grassroots action to prove that a different model is possible. But I think the important thing that happened, and that's why I think we can put uh, CC here in the middle, that over time, um, actually Creative Commons became very involved in working with policies and if I were to describe a lot of what happened in say the last five years a lot of the successes were around policy work so introducing rules that would enable really large spread of open licensing I will not go into that because the next talk you will hear is about open licensing um, <coughs> but but when we speak about designing, I just want to give one example. This fine line means that you cannot just think about policy. You have to think also about humans and sort of do interventions. And this is an example I really like. Um, it's, a, it's a Finnish project called the Restaurant Day. It happens once a year by now all over the world. And, and the idea was pretty simple, and it has been designed thoughtfully. It was just an idea that on one day people will open informal restaurants. Uh, you could either set up a stand and sell toast and coffee, or you could do something very fancy and offer four-course meals or five-course meals. But the idea was to get people engaged. That's not yet policy. There is a policy part there. This had to do with the fact that um, Finland has pretty strict laws concerning food safety, which made it very difficult to open new restaurants. And uh, this action sort of led to policy change, which sort of freed up the space and actually can find quotes by Finnish officials saying that this was the most important in years policy intervention in the sphere of restaurants and dining, which sort of made the dining uh, community a lot more vibrant in, in main cities at least and, and opened people to you know, new ethnicities and so on. A simple step, just setting up an informal restaurant caused really big policy and cultural change. So I really like this example because this is a design policy set up by a think tank that functioned for several years called um, Helsinki Design Lab. But, so to move on, oh, there's someone online, hello. Um, moving on from generally policy to copyright policy, I think we sort of, copyright is this, huge mountain in front of us. Uh, it has its advantages, you can climb it and there are beautiful views, but for a lot of time we release it in the shadow of the... It, it casts a shadow over our lives, over our education, over our culture, and, and causes a lot of problems. So I think copyright work, and I'm speaking about it because that's the area of policy I know. I decided I will not try to speak about transparency or privacy, issues that are very important but I simply don't have experience with. So with copyright reform, it's an issue, how do we sort of deal with this big challenge? Um, to be honest, I think we're facing some kind of a zeitgeist challenge. I feel that several years ago or a decade ago, copyright made people a lot more exciting. Uh, it might be also me just getting a bit old uh, and getting tired of certain issues, but, but I have this sense that certain energy behind copyright reform activism that was present a while ago maybe is a bit uh, decreasing today. I know Ryan will talk a bit about this. All I know that my personal approach is that we cannot give up, that this is a long run um, that we have to deal with. And in copyright sphere you, you need to understand that policy is also politics. I think by the way that policy is a kind of hard term to use, people don't understand it, it doesn't sound very exciting. We could do a lot better by calling it politics. Of course, it's not that simple. We often don't want policy to be politics, but in practice it often is. is. So in, in, in the copyright world, the, the sort of ugly scenario when it becomes political is that copyright becomes mainly about economy. It's a discussion, who should get the money? In the European Union, there's this idea of a value tree, sometimes called the value chain, and it's just basically a discussion about how will the money flow, who will have to pay, who will get the money. And the whole thing that's left aside basically is culture and society. So we're not asking questions, how does this copyright work in a society and for a society? And that's what we need. 
So, as I said, Creative Commons sort of came into this picture quite a long time ago. By now, it's been 15, more or exactly 15, something like that, years, and, and offered sort of um, um, an alternative. And I said that there's this motion between uh, doing grassroots work and policy work, but there's also a certain motion between doing open licensing work, about which you are here in a moment, and copyright reform work. And this is a process that Creative Commons went through, and I was involved in it personally, and I think it's a very important one, because at some point, Creative Commons, oh, sorry, that's the quote again. Um, understood that it's, it's not a perfect solution, and this is something that takes some courage for a movement or organization to say. Uh, we understood that licensing proves sort of a different reality and copyright is possible, but doesn't create it, because it's pretty obvious to you that we will never get 100% of content under a free license. So there are nice quotes you can find saying that CC is not, uh, is just a patch uh, or it's just a band-aid, but it's not a full uh, fix or a full cure. And I think this is a very interesting idea that led us to start working more on copyright reform. And this is something we have been doing, for instance, in Europe with the organization we call Comunia. And to move a bit even further into what I see as a sort of Matryoshka doll of policy than copyright policy. And the third step is something I'm interested very much at the moment, which is copyright reform for education. And this is one of our priority areas in Comunia. And I think, I hope education is important for you. I think there's a very strong way of thinking about uh, Wikipedia as an educational project. And um, we think a lot about why we need copyright reform for education. And the thing I recently realized, why this is so strong, is that if you compare what open licensing can do in, edu in education and what copyright reform can do in education, then my belief is that in the end, copyright reform can achieve more. So consider, in copyright law, there's this thing called exceptions and limitations. It's basically spaces of freedom where you can freely use work. And today, these spaces don't work very well in the digital reality. If you're in a, so to say, classroom in a school, your mileage might vary depending on the country you live in, but you're, might, you're probably doing relatively well in terms of freely using content. There might be some payments involved, and in some countries, rules are really, really strange. Like in Spain, you can use parts of an artwork, but not the full one. But uh, in general, um, it's broken when it comes to digital reality. So if you're a teacher in Poland and you want to show a movie in school, you're fine. If you have a blog and you want to somehow share that with others because that's how you feel digital education should work, no way. So if you consider what it would mean that there would be exceptions strong enough to uh, allow Wikipedia to have any use of content as long as it's educational, probably say you're crazy. But if you then think about it, that would be something extremely strong. And the reason I'm saying this is this proves that copyright reform work, it's very hard, but if it's successful, it can achieve a lot. So this is something um, we've been doing. But what we realize in the process, and I think this is a challenge that you'll also be facing, is that we're pretty good in reaching the community of, of, of so the open community. We have all the contacts, we know more or less people who are interested in education from the open perspective. But the thing we found out is that the people we really need to engage is the educational mainstream. And these are the people to whom you cannot talk in a policy language even if you want to talk about policy. So with Comunia we've been trying to make some efforts to find a new language to speak about policy. And it's a language that where you basically don't use the term policy. So, for instance, recently we did an action where we tried to highlight challenges around sharing public domain resources due to broken copyright law in Europe, where we demonstrated that Anne Frank uh, diaries can be shared in, in Poland freely. They're in public domain, but not in other parts of Europe. And, and the important part there was that we actually shared the, um, the journal itself. So we went beyond doing policy talk and tried to do policy action. Another project we're doing is called Best Case Scenarios for Copyright. We're doing it right now. And in this project, we try to, for instance, flip the typical language of copyright activism, where you're saying the law is broken, the law is broken, we need to change it. 
and we're actually trying to show that in Europe, in some countries, the law is pretty good. And we're actually quite happy with it. And what we should be doing is spreading this good regulation around Europe, which we're hoping sort of throws the, the opposition off its feet because they're expecting us to be very critical and we're not that critical. But I think the, the ultimate challenge we face with, with thinking about policies is that policies don't really build engagement. So I think this is something Creative Commons, a place we got into where we have quite good policies. For instance, in Poland, we have a policy that made a really big set of open textbooks publicly available under a free license, and we're very happy with it. But we're not sure about engagement because there's nothing in this policy that makes people use this content, uh, want to use this content. So this is the question of how do you make them press the edit button. I don't think any policy will do that because policy cannot uh, regulate motivations. Um, this is an image I really like. This is from Catalonia. They're preparing to build one of these human towers. Uh, and there's no policy for that. It's just humans doing things. So I think in the end, policy is about this sort of circular flow where you need to do some policy and then you need to do some engagement, and no one can do this on their own. So policy for me needs conversation. It needs kind of a, a deal, a deal of cooperation between a small group of people who's willing to sit in rooms during long meetings with politicians and lobbyists, uh, and uh, on the other side, people who don't really want to understand policy, but they need to support this, and in order to support this, they need some sense of what's going on. I want to throw at the very end a completely random thought uh, about the future of policy. I've been reading a lot about what's going on right now with blockchain and with the so-called DAO. I don't know if any of you follow this, but basically it's an attempt to create contracts that don't require any social contract. They're fully coded. It's not working very well. At the moment, it seems $50 million got lost because someone put faith in code. But I think it suggests a future where we might believe that code can shape our reality. But you know, there's this pretty famous quote saying that software might eat our world, actually, instead of shaping it. And I think in the long term, we'll find out that policy, which we today see as something maybe quite boring and impressive, will be something very important if we want to have civic oversight over our reality, and particularly technology, because it's policy, uh, by which I understand humans agreeing how to run things, uh, that will allow us to have control over code and technology. But that's sort of a long view into the future. For now, I want to leave you with a quote by an activist that's very famous in Poland, Jacek Kulań, who under communism said, don't burn committees, build your own ones. The committees he was speaking about were the Central Com Committee of the Communist Party and the regional ones. And he was saying basically that instead of focusing all the time on the fight, you should also try to positively build your own solutions. Um, and this is, I think, where we are. We're building these solutions around open, but also fighting for copyright reform. Thank you very much. And now I give the floor to Ryan Merkley, who's the CEO of Creative Commons. And basically, this was my idea of avoiding a situation where we won't have any comments and questions. I basically provide my first comment and question. Also, the trick is Ryan didn't know what I will be talking about, so he was sitting here with a kind of intellectual blindfold, and now we'll just freestyle. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is, this is the best where Alex doesn't say a word to me about what he's going to say and then says, just come up and react. It'll be great. Don't worry about it. Um, so thank you. Uh, my name is Ryan. I'm the CEO of Creative Commons. I work with Alec, who leads uh, work in Poland and also a lot of global work around uh, CC, but also copyright reform more generally. Um, on Monday, I was in Brussels speaking um, at uh, Bayuk, which is uh, an EU consumer rights association. They invited me to speak to them about uh, the intersection between consumers and copyright. Um, and, you know, I think it's a complicated question because in the end, most consumers, your average, regular, everyday person, doesn't really care about copyright. Um, and they don't interact with it in the ways that we do when we make things and we are producing new things. And so there's this, this tension and, and when we drive movement, movements, we think about, well, we have to get everybody, we have to bring everybody on board, we have to educate them about the challenges of copyright. And the reality is we actually don't. Um, and I think one of the things that we, um, and just to put it in context, actually, I had a tweet here I wanted to show you uh, or share with you. Uh, so uh, somebody named uh, Jens Hendrickson uh, posted something very 
beautiful, and then I paraphrased it and translated it with Google Translate and made it less beautiful. But in response to some of my comments in that talk said, quote, copyright is the plumbing of society and we need to improve the flow, which I, I like that idea. I like the concept of um, copyright being something as an enabler, I wasn't. The intention wasn't to make it so important that it was, you know, the only plumbing of society. There's wiring, there's other things, and maybe just one of the pipes, so to speak. Um, but somebody immediately snapped back, as the internet always does, and said, "Where is he? Here he is." He said, um, he compared it to a urinary tract infection, and then the third poster said, "I wouldn't so much say plumbing. I'd say a lump of toilet paper stuck in the sewage pipe." Which sort of just reminded me that, again, we who care about copyright are strange. And we live in a strange environment where we care about these, these detailed things. And if we want the public to be with us, we need to find a way to draw a straight line connection between what we care about, what, what happens in copyright, and what they actually care about. And I'll give you just one example of how we're now doing that at CC. Um, and, and to be you know, candid, while CC's global movement has been active in copyright and copyright reform all over, CCHQ, the global organization, has been less inclined to step in squarely into the role of advocacy and to even say that we are advocates. And that's a new space for us to say that CC has a voice um, and CC has one that it, it should uh, share publicly around these issues. And one of the things that we've tried to do is more directly connect the benefit that regular people care about with uh, the role that copyright and openness can play in solving that. I'll give you an example. So about uh, a month and a half ago, um, I wrote an op-ed that appeared in Wired Magazine um, about open access to research. It was ostensibly referring to Sci-Hub and the issues that were happening there, but ended with a call to support the President of the United States call in his State of the Union to open up the research around cancer to drive innovation. To answer the kind of question of how do we get more innovation in research, one of the ways that we do that is we open it up and let people access it because then you get text and data mining because then you get every researcher who's interested and every patient and every doctor not running into a paywall for work that the public already paid for. And to get to this place where right now, you know, copyright restrictions lock down text and data mining and prevent it, but also technical uh, obscurities pr pr uh, put in place by the publishers who don't pay for the works um, but publish them and then restrict access to them. Now that got picked up and only a couple of days later the vice president quoted that op-ed um, and was interested in that topic. And I don't think the vice president particularly cares about copyright. I won't speak for him, but I definitely think that he cares about the outcome. His, his comments at the uh, a national uh, collection of cancer researchers was, I think this question matters. I think it's something important that we should think about. How do we open these works up? Because innovation, because we care about the outcome. And once we started to change the discussion for the public, for cancer patients, for government, to the benefits that accrue from openness, we started to have a very different group of people who care about copyright. And I, I would guess that the coalition of people that we're now working with around what the vice president calls the cancer moonshot, um, and our small, very small part in that, um, don't really, those people don't really care about copyright, and they might never care about copyright. But if we tell them that copyright reform and openness become the answer to innovation and the answer to how we get more access and equity when we make the case around things like education, then those people now come with us. And we have a much, um, a, a much larger tent under which to have that discussion. And it's one of the things that I learned in my time at Mozilla. You know, Mozilla has a very large community of contributors. And not surprisingly, they don't all agree. And there's a tendency to think over time, especially in very large communities like Mozilla or Wikipedia, that everyone has the same political bent. And nothing could possibly be further from the truth. There are some people who share a subset of values, but those people all come from polit different political stripes and have different ideas behind them. And so you really need to tap into those particular values and benefits and find cases where those people agree and connect. And so policy can be very divisive um, when it's meant to be uniting in these kinds of organizations where everybody agrees that we want to build the platform, everybody agrees that we want open licensing, but they might not necessarily agree with the policy outcome that we're working towards or the pieces that sit underneath it. So, I mean, that was my thought as you were talking about engaging communities at the end. And maybe I'll just leave it there. And if people have questions, um, I think Alec and I are happy to take them. All right, thank you.
and now we will entertain you until the next speaker comes. <laughs>